Buenas tardes, buenos días a todos. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos en otro Conversando con Cisos. Mi nombre es Edgar Rojas, desde acá de Estados Unidos, y con nosotros eh, nuestro colega Andrés Almanza desde Bogotá. Andrés, ¿qué más? ¿Cómo te va? Pues no, muy bien, Edgar. Muy bien, aquí, juicioso, con algo de buen clima hoy. No está ah, lloviendo. Bueno. <risa> Entonces, <risa> ah, bueno. Entonces, todo muy bien. Todo Excelente. Muy bien. Eh, por acá tenemos un, un, un panel, Andrés. Este es un panel de lujo, papá. Eh, sí, señor. Recién sacaditos del horno de, de, de DEFCON. Nos acompañaron por acá. Eh, y tenemos pues a Robert Graham, a Curtis Minder y a, a Liz Wharton. Liz has, ha, ha estado con nosotros en varias ocasiones y estuvo con nosotros en el, en el primer Season Latin Summit en Cartagena, en la, por allá en el 2019, antes del COVID. Andrés fue más de parece. Sí, Ay, sí, esa sí, cosa. sí, sí. Ya parece de mucho tiempo, pero no. Pero bueno, Gracias. y ahora pues eh, la invitación es a todos que nos acompañen el eh, 7 de octubre en el CISO Latin Summit. Andrés, tenemos unos participantes eh, impresionantes, eh, gente de Forge Rock. Ah, Forge Rock, tenemos a Víctor Ake, cofundador de Forge Rock, como wow. el, uno de los keynotes. O sea, muy bien. Vamos a ver quién nos trae Beyond Trust eh, y la gente pues de Exabin, Sonic Wall, nuestros amigos de Fluid Attacks nos van a estar acompañando. Así que va a estar muy interesante. El tema de hoy, Andrés, es continuando con la conversación de hace dos semanas que hemos tenido las, las últimas dos semanas acerca de en ransomware. Ransom. Resulta que eh, en la conversación que tuvimos, eh, pues hace un par de semanas atrás, en el DEFCON, estuvo Liz, eh, estuvo Rob y creo que Curtis también estuvo presente eh, como panelistas en DEFCON, hablando acerca de ransomware. Entonces, yo me contacté con Liz y le dije, Liz, ayúdame a tráeme la gente del Defcon Panel. Y me dijo, sosté mi cerveza, hold my beer. Y a los cinco minutos me dijo, te tengo a Rob Graff, te tengo a Curtis Minder. Y yo, ¿cómo oh, fue madre? De lujo, de lujo. Así que, mm. bueno, vamos a comenzar esta conversación. Hacemos el switch a, a, a inglés. ¿Te parece? Sí, por supuesto. Y, y a todos, de nuevo, por el chat, Q&A, cualquier pregunta que tengan, hagan este, este evento, estas charlas son como siempre para todos nosotros. Uh, so, thank you very much, Liz and Curtis and Rob, for being with us. Really, really nice. Welcome to uh, conversing with uh, CISOs in Latin America. Um, the topic today is, again, it's ransomware. Uh, but before we start there, uh, just let's take a few couple of seconds or, you know, a minute or so to let everyone know, you know, who you are so they know who we're talking to. Uh, so we start with Liz. Well, thank you. So I'm Liz Wharton. I'm Chief of Staff at Scythe. We are an adversary emulation platform, but more relevant to this conversation is I was the Senior Assistant City Attorney for the City of Atlanta and the Atlanta mm -hmm. Airport as we were attacked or came under a ransomware attack and then helped lead some of the recovery for that. But I've also worked in public policy on helping advise on exactly how to handle the evolving ransomware. Thank you. All right. Rob? Hi, my name is Robert Graham. Um, I'm well known for having created a bunch of tools like Mascan or 20 years ago, Black Ice was a popular tool. Also the uh, sidejacking attack in 2007. Uh, most recently, ransomware related. I, uh, I've done lots of pen tests that basically are a ransomware attack that um, we just didn't encrypt the things. <laughs> uh, and so, um, and my tools are also frequently used by ransomware hackers as part of their attacks. It's one of the problems with ransomware is that all the white hat hacker tools are the primary tools that black hat ransomware attackers use. Wow, that's a, that's a nice, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that one in a second. Uh, Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. I'm Curtis Minder. I'm the CEO of GroupSense. Uh, it's a digital risk protection company, but relevant to this conversation, I'm also the person that built our ransomware response program and am the primary negotiator on, on many of our ransomware negotiation cases. Oof. Let's start with that one uh, because primary <laughs> negotiator, Andres, primary negotiator. It, it, 
<laughs> what is? I mean, what, what, yes. What what the hell is a primary negotiator in a ransomware? What 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 entails? Well, I mean, first and foremost, we you know, as an intelligence company, effectively, that's what what GroupSense does. Uh, when we're brought in by, you, typically, we're brought in by a cyber insurance or a, a law firm that does breach response. When we're brought into a victim case, uh, you know, first and foremost, our job is to inform the victim um, everything that they need that that we have that they need to know to make a a business decision about whether to engage the threat actors uh, that are perpetrating the attack at all, right? And so that, that's information about the attacker themselves, about their methods of operation. Uh, are they trustworthy? Do the decryptors actually work most of the time? How long does it take to decrypt these things? Uh, all of that stuff. And that plays into their business decision around, you know, can they afford to be down? How long? <laughs> What's their budget if they are going to pay Um, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but once they've made that decision, uh, they've decided to, uh, to engage the threat actor, we act as the primary liaison between them and the threat actor group. Uh, we do this with 100% transparency. So no messages are sent without their complete approval, right? Okay. Um, and it's all, it's all agreed on in, in advance. Uh, and our goal then is to, to reduce the amount uh, that is being asked for to the lowest amount possible. Um, and then if necessary, we will also help with the financial transaction component of, of the of the payment. Okay, wow. So so it's like a hostage <laughs> hostage negotiator. Yes. Oh my god. Yeah, except except you can't. So here's some things that people don't think about is you can't read tone, body language. <laughs> and yeah. many of these people um, are, are speaking an Eastern European or Russian language. Uh, and they're often just dumping that into Google Translate. So there's a lot of nuances in, in how you communicate that are really important uh, in the process. Okay, so wow. uh, for Liz, this is a, because Curtis said, you know, the cyber insurance or the law firm brings you in to determine what to do next, right? Uh, the, 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 do that risk analysis and everything. My question, you know, as a, your ransomware survivor, um, it, is that something that's already too late at that point to do a risk analysis and how we're going to negotiate? Is that something that needs to happen before? What, I mean, once you've once you are in the war room, so to speak, and stuff has gone on, you are still having to evaluate because what you may have thought was going to happen uh, changes minute by minute, and depending on the uh, attack and how they got into your system, what has and you know the best laid plans. Uh, so it, I can hear, I mean, certain things three years ago when we were dealing with this never changes, it never occurred or the conversation never was, uh, discussed of actually negotiating, but at the same time, there are different approaches that we wouldn't have to worry about now, other things that would come up. And so it, the conversation with Curtis's company would just be different, um, mm -hmm. But, and uh, okay, and and that is definitely a requirement. That that some, I mean, again, you know, in in our IRP, you know, documentation and everything, I've never seen, you know, uh, one of the yeah, steps yeah. engage yeah. engage a negotiator. I mean, yes. because right, I mean, it's it's not there. Uh, that that's that's a new one. That's a new one to me. It's, it's incredible. Rob, what do you think? It's it's negotiating. Uh, part of uh the strategy, or is that like like a last step, first step? Well, I, I think the, the statement was that he wasn't hired by the, the victim. The, he exactly. Was hired mm -hmm. By the lawyers and the insurance companies, right? Yeah. Correct. So I, I think that's their strategy once they're on the hook of, of dealing with it. It's, I don't see that something you can prepare for other than, you know, maybe prepare, like, you know, have lawyers on tap that know ransomware or have, um, In, uh, cyber insurance. So that would be their strategy rather than your own strategy. So the strategy changes based on who the owner of the situation is at that moment. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And also, it, it, we're all, it, there's only so much preparation you can do. And you're, you're, it's coming from the point of view of like, if I'm a master person that knows everything, I'm prepared for everything, what's everything I can do? And the reality of ransomware is the opposite of there's a few things that I can practically do within my budget within the certain time frame with the resources I have available 
with the people I have. I can do those things. But you know, 90% of what I should be doing for ransomware, I'm not going to do because I just, I don't have the time, the budget, the, you know, the education. I, I'm just not going to do it. And two, keep in mind when Curtis is coming in or his company and any of the other uh, advisors or responders that are coming in to help you keep in mind what their goals are, who's basically, who's paying their invoice. Um, and because you may have different objectives or they may not align entirely. And that's perfectly fine. As long as you understand when they're uh, approaching a solution, it may not be how quickly can we get X up and running, maybe how do we minimize future exposure or how do we do that? So it's just, everyone has a different perspective as they're sitting around the table uh, in the incident response room, the war room. Yeah, so to speak. I was going to bring up incident response because, well, first I'll say that, that yes, we are most often brought in by law firms and, and cyber insurance co companies. However, we are approached directly by many victims, most of which uh, we were just talking about before we, we, yeah. we launched the webinar, most of which people never hear about. Right, which are the smaller, mm -hmm. the smaller enterprises, things like that, um, that that just don't even know what to do next. And so, when those folks call us, and, and this is outside the, the law firms or, or cyber insurance, um, you know, I, I am guiding them to a proper AR firm. We partner with a bunch of those folks, um, an IR firm, sorry, an IR firm, an incident yeah. responder, right. uh, because frankly, part of the equation uh, when we're making the, the business decision is confidence level zero to ten. Uh, can the bad guy still get in? <laughs> Because exactly. if they can, uh, that changes the equation, like from a from a leverage perspective, right? And so it, it's a it's a it's a group effort. Uh, most incident responder firms, with some exceptions, don't do the no negotiation or interaction or facilitation of payment. So we're 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 working in tandem with those folks. Okay. Yeah. So like as you mentioned before, <clears throat> we started the webinar. We were talking about what is the real current status of ransomware. Because my question to you, my statement was, you know, we hear about ransomware. And then ransomware is everywhere and everyone is like, ah, oh, the sky is falling, then it disappears. And then it starts to come up again. So this past weekend, a uh, major mm -hmm. firm was ransomware. And it, and I, I, I told Liz, you know, I'm like, wow, this is going to be a hot topic. Perfect. We're going to be discussing this during the show. We didn't hear nothing back on Monday, right? Friday, <laughs> and it died Friday afternoon. And like, we went on vacation. Um, so... Rob, to you, what is the current real status of ransomware? I mean, is it rampant or is it all yellow, you know, journalism? Well, it's not yellow journalism. It's just that news means new things, right? So ransomware is sort of a constant, and but it's not new anymore. So mm -hmm. it's still going on at the same levels as it's, as it's been for, you know, it's been growing. It's probably still growing. Um, there are several cybersecurity firms that have statistics on this and you see that the graphs are pretty constant. It's only when something new happens like the colonial pipeline shutting down gasoline that it becomes something different, something new, something interesting that the public cares about. So it's not that it's, it's gone away, it's that, or that the news, that the journalisms are intentionally hiding things. It's just, it's not interesting anymore. It's happening, it's just not interesting. Well, I think, I think what I actually, one of the things I think you hit on is that uh, being able to tie the event to the impact of the, new, the, the news constituents, right? So the, like the, that, that band of companies that I talked about that, that nobody hears about, it's really difficult to tie you know, a, a florist to impact. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, right. Right. Um, and, and Liz, you, you, you uh, tweeted something yesterday, which was a, was a, a big number. I wasn't aware of that. But was it 48%, 42%, 46% of hospitals? Of U.S. hospitals uh, in mm -hmm. the last six months had had to reboot their systems because of ransomware. 46%. 46%. Yeah. 46% of all U.S. hospitals in the last six months. Mm -hmm. That's that that's incredible, especially, you know, with the COVID thing going on. I mean, now we're talking about, you know, affecting real lives, not just financial, but, you know, life. <laughs> well, I, I would qualify that because when you say that the, the hospital was hit, was it because the business documents were encrypted or was it because... Mm -hmm medical equipment was shut down. And it's usually, well, okay, I've got two. 
sources of data here, so I don't, I, I shouldn't say usually, but in my talking to medical professionals from, from DEF CON was that it was just their business systems that were hit. They, they came in, they encrypted documents, they encrypted databases, they made billing hard, um, it made access to, to electronic records hard for a little bit, but it didn't really affect the medical care itself. So the instrumentation and stuff were actually doing live surgery, you know, that, that was not affected. But access to, to uh, medical history, medical records that, that will and could impact right before a surgery. I mean, that it was, well, it's more of a long term because you usually okay. it's been out in some form when they're in the current care. So if it can't get repaired within a week, then it'll start affecting patients. But, you know, just that yeah. day, it's not like, you know, you have to get that right away. Okay. It's like the nurses stations, they have the printed forms. They know what drugs are being assigned to the patient in room five. Um, so they're not really affected when the database goes down immediately. Okay. But, but that's still, that's a, a humongous, huge, huge number. Right. Yeah. Those this number is huge. Well, and Curtis, are y'all seeing that there's been a shift where the attackers actually know who they're hitting or are they still doing a scatter shot approach where they're just throwing everything against the wall and, oh, it just happens to have hit a hospital <laughs> or had they figured out that hospitals will pay, they'll pay quicker. So let's make sure like, you know, are, there be, are they being strategic in the use of their resources? It depends on which group. I mean, the, the, the different ransomware operators have different sort of go-to markets, if you will. So they're, they're attacking different target targets. Uh, some of them are wide, widespread sort of uh, opportunistic in nature. And other ones are, and, and you probably heard them in the media referred to as big game hunting. They're looking for the eccentrics of the world. Uh, and, they're, and they will spend some time understanding their target, understanding uh, what data is important to their target, um, and then using that as leverage in, in the price, right? What, what I have seen, I will say, is that when, when uh, with the exception of sort of the bottom feeders that are hitting the really small businesses, most of these uh, operators are now making a standard operating procedure to grab as much financial data from inside the network as possible um, so that, that they can understand how much money the company's making, uh, how much cash they have in the bank, and using that as leverage as part of, of setting the, the ransom price. Are, are these groups... the uh sophisticated that is that they have uh part of the groups that the part of their departments do all of this research and then they're like you know this is the uh, healthcare group this is the financial group this is the critical infrastructure yes I mean, so, so i will i will make a, a very specific distinction the organizational structure of some of these groups is sophisticated as if it's a business with with certain roles and responsibilities and escalation paths and quotas and <laughs> all of the things that you would expect from a, from a business the attacks they're employing are not very sophisticated so they're not mm -hmm. using super sophisticated tools to do this uh it's it's they're they're using b very basic attacks uh yeah and well and robert you mentioned right you created black eyes a long time ago and and and, and you mentioned that some of these hackers or they use some of the tools that you yeah. cre you still created. Right, like I mean, math scan is, is a tool they'll use. Like when they get into a network, they'll scan the network. And the fastest way to do that is with math scan. There's also other tools like RDP scan, which is popular, which looks for RDP uh, services, which is a common vector, either because using uh, exploiting the O day, the zero day uh, uh, vulnerability, or because you want to find them so that uh, when you get passwords or other credentials that you can use them against the RDP server. So what is one of the recommendations that you, that you can provide to people to do detection mechanisms when they're being scanned like that? Do they need to, like, if you scan X amount of times, blah, 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 you know, you're being, you're being attacked? The, the easiest and simplest recommendation is to get a canary type device like uh, things canary or there's open canary and these are simply devices on the network that when scanned tell you that hey someone scanned me and so there's someone on the network doing a scan uh, firewall logs and uh, router flow logs or other logs from the systems can also get this information very easily but they tend to be noisy um, putting a, a device a, a canary on the network um, 
is uh, simulates a, a, a desktop. So it's not the whole network vision, but it's it, if someone's scanning, they're going to hit that device eventually. And it's pretty, the, the signal to noise ratio is higher than just looking at the logs. And I, and I know, I mean, you know, a long time ago, I was at a company and that uh, they had created their own IPS and it was like the new stuff that was like 11, 12, 15 years ago. And they were talking, about, they created canary type of deception points, right? Part of the IPS. We're talking technology from 15 plus years ago. And, and we're saying, right, as Curtis said, the attacks are not sophisticated themselves. And, and we, we, we have the technology that we can implement uh, to you don't, right now, you, but... You don't even need technology. You can just set up a Windows machine with a special account and, um, and just turn on all the logging. And so you know that that machine's logs are more important because that no one is there and uh, just give it a higher priority. And so that's what can, most of the Canary products do is they simply do the normal thing, but just focus their attention on it. And so you can canaryize anything. You can put Word documents up on the server that you know that no one should be opening. Uh, uh, like, you know, only administrators can access this Word document. Well, if someone accesses it, you know, call it passwords.xls or something, and you know that someone tries to open it, that they're a bad, a bad person. So this is this is something. This is something like what uh, our friend Wendy Nather, you know, talks about living security under the poverty line. It's like you don't need to purchase everything. You have, as you said, Rob, you have all this equipment right. already. Use it properly. And, and Microsoft also has a bunch of techs. You know, if you want to secure yourself against ransomware, you don't need to buy any product at all. There's no product you need to buy other than what you already have. The, the reason you buy products is to will make it easier because it, it's you don't need to train people if you can have some products that simplify it. You don't need to pay people to do all the work when you can just buy a product that automates it. And that's why you buy products, not because they can do some magic that you can't do yourself. Okay. Liz, you put in, your, in the chat, I'm picturing monthly board meetings with PowerPoint slides. <laughs> I am. I picture the, okay, we're going to, you know, can someone tell us the total addressable market for these types of victims? Uh, and is it worth, I mean, I, I'm completely. Oh, oh from, oh, this is from the yeah. uh, attacker. So, yeah. That's a, that's a fair point. And, and we do see them, uh, some of the groups, uh, some of the ones that you hear about in the media, specifically targeting very specific verticals with uh, what we would say like a low security IQ where, where there are traditional like manufacturing operations, shipping logistics or something like that, but the impact is really high, right? So they, it's very easy to get in. And if you make their operations stop, it's very expensive for them. So they, they, do, they do target those deliberately. There was a, one of the employees of one of these hacker groups uh, was disaffected and published all the internal documents from <laughs> his company um, that kind of showed this process. It was really interesting to, to read because it includes all their, their hacker techniques, exactly what their playbook is once they hack in to go XXX until they hit the, uh, the ransomware. But also it was interesting about to, to see his comments on like things like quotas and stuff, you know, their job and, and reflecting very much the, the, the dissatisfaction that a lot of people have at their works that no one listens to them, their quotas are too much, their boss is a jerk. <laughs> um, and it, it was very much just a normal IT employee whose job it was to not defend systems, but attack them. Yeah. So the black hat. Okay. Um, the, the three of you are tremendous experts. When, when you, when you hear the comment, you know, from someone in the media patch, um, what's, what's your thing that they come up with the most, uh, oh yeah. Enable. The, the latest, you know, endpoint security solutions so that you know exactly what's happening, you know, and, and or, or enable AI. How does that make you feel? I mean, what, what is your reaction when you hear somebody come up with that? I was neutral until you said AI, but I'll, I'll, let, Rob, <laughs> I'll let Rob take this one because I know it's a soapbox. Yeah, it, it is my soapbox. I, I, anyone who tells you that you need to do more patching is, is not serious about ransomware. You, well, yes, you probably do need to know patching. You all know that. I mean, it's not, it's not like this thing you haven't heard of before. 
it's like a doctor saying eat less and do more exercise or, you know, you know, change the oil on your car. It's like, we all know this. We all hear this, but the reason that things aren't patched isn't because you don't know that you should patch or that you are lazy or that you're, you know, stupid. <laughs> it's, it, it's because there are good reasons in, in, in the enterprise why things don't get patched. And, um, it is costly. It causes network downtime. Uh, systems get lost, like they're still online, but you've you know removed them from your inventory. It's just lots of reasons. Um, and so uh, we're, we're we're patching about as much as we can. But it's if someone has like moral authority, like you know standing on a soapbox and saying you know you people you need to patch more. Um, yeah, it's easy to have that moral authority when you don't have technical authority. You know. If I don't know anything, if I don't know anything about the industry, I can tell you don't click on attachments and patch more. And that, that will solve your ransomware problem. I don't, I don't need to have any knowledge. It's just I have that moral conviction that it's because you are lazy that you're not doing these things. That, 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 that statement is one of the ones that, to me, it, it gets me the most. And Andres has seen me when I react to don't click you know, on third-party unknown emails. And I'm like, but if you're part of the... You know, ac accounts payable department, you're going to get PDFs from people you have no idea. You're going to tell them don't click on that? Right. And, and inevitably, they're busy, they're going through, and one's going to slip by. And creating a culture where if you realize you've clicked on something you weren't supposed to, and you don't have to fear, but don't have to fear for your job, you're more likely to say, oh, that was bad let me go report this now rather than trying to hide it, deny it. Like, Oh, that wasn't me. And now you're three hours behind when maybe you could pull some stuff offline or you could do some other mitigations immediately. If you've created a culture that like, Hey, you're human. It's okay. Tell us that. Creating culture and the culture applies to everything, right? It doesn't matter if it's specific to run somewhere or whatever. How do you how do you do that? What's your recommendation for creating culture? Is that power a lot of PowerPoint presentations on cybersecurity? Is that uh, videos, funny videos of a stupid person doing stupid stuff, and you're like, that ah, is not going to be me? Is that uh, you know weekly emails? How, how how do you do create the culture? I think we've seen a lot of what not to do. Uh, during, uh, especially as people respond to COVID and they're using like very enticing, you're like, Hey, we're going to give you some COVID relief. Well, like your bonus click here. And then employees will be like, wait, this was a phishing email, but I thought I was going to like, Oh, well now I feel both stupid and I want that money. You promised me, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's not a good one. And yeah, as Elizabeth was saying, it's, I don't think we know how to create good culture, but I think we know how bad culture is created. Wow. That. That's, a good, that's a good shirt. <laughs> yeah, yes, it is a good shirt. Well, I mean, I, I will say, you know, the, the, there's, no, there's no one answer to that question, uh, but as a, as a CEO of a company, part of my job is that, creating culture. Uh, and I don't know if I'm good at it. I'm not saying I'm great at it. But what I do, what I do know is, uh, it, it is creating, um, it's communication primarily. It's, it's heavy mm -hmm. and, and, and open communication, transparency, and leading by example. Okay. Uh, but you, like, for example, like what, ransomware aside, admitting publicly in the business when you've done something wrong, right? <laughs> when you recognize you've made a mistake, that makes other people feel okay to do the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, so we, we uh, I had a question and it just went away. Damn it. <laughs> I, too much, too much aguardiente. Too much aguardiente. Sorry. Aguardiente. <laughs> but I, I do like the point that was being raised earlier. Of you know, you don't need more. Like, use what you have. You've already spent this money yes. on it. Yes. And that's one of the things. And of course, that comes with the shameless plug. Uh, but <laughs> products that Scythe offers. But going and checking and seeing, are we deploying? the tools we've purchased appropriately. And if they're not like, okay, what do we need to change? And do they stop this? Like, what can we realistically expect them to do? Not with the salesperson six months ago, 
promise they were going to do. And it's kind of the attack, detect, respond, attack your own system, attack your own settings and network and see, see what it's detecting and then figure out a response that works for what you have. And also making sure everyone, just because one department has received the budget, the buy-in, on some of this, one of the trends I'm seeing is the IT folks saying, yes, we have the budget, we're good to go. But HR uh, and the other business sides aren't, don't have the same risks, priorities. So they're not willing to, you know, like we need them to do the training. We need them to put in these, fo the following protocols and it's not their priority, so they don't care. <laughs> I, I, would, I would add to that though, Test the test the fences, also test the fire extinguishers, right? So like, <laughs> so yes. basically what, what we've learned firsthand is some of the most, the largest firms that we've dealt with, very mature organizations, we have uh, well put together IR and, and business continuity plans, uh, haven't adequately tested, for example, those business continuity plans. So, you know, we'll start the discussion uh, when the event occurs and, and, it's, and it sounds like, hey, look, you know what? We, we probably don't have to pay. We've got these backups. And then two days later, they come back and they say, it turns out the backups are going to take six months. Right. And so mm -hmm. we need to pay because we need that data like tomorrow, right? Exactly. And so <laughs> at least understanding those things uh, before, beforehand and testing them is, is important so that you can make a, the, the, the decision quickly. So, so that goes to one of the statements that we made before we came online. And the statement that we made during the program last week is, you know, where should you focus your efforts? I mean, we have limited resources, right, from the cybersecurity organization. Mm -hmm. where, where should we all uh, focus our efforts in regards to ransomware? My recommendation last week, and I stand by it, is it's, it's with, like what Curtis says. I, I recommend focus on what we definitely have control of. We have control 100% of backups and restores, and we have control. Okay, Robbie's saying, I should have- I was going to get in front of that. Robert, that's like, this is that's that. Okay, that's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. This is my, my, my view, and then we go to Robert. My view is that I have control of backups and restore. I can control the processes. So the process says, as soon as I do a backup, I want to do a random restore multiple files and make sure that it works. That's one. The storage of that equipment, right, or, or, or those of those disks, uh, it's going to be close by where I can get to them, but it's not going to be, it's going to be offline. And then after a while, I'll, I'll, I'll take it away. But that's what I will focus on. Robert says, no. What will you focus on? And, and you know, what, what's, what's something? Well, actually, I, I mostly agree with you. That, <laughs> um, oh, yes. I want to get my shirt. <laughs> Rob, most of the group. Rob, uh, there, there, there's, three, there's three things to look at. One of which is your perimeter, how they got in. The next is, once they were in, how did they spread and get to all your files and encrypt them? And then the third one is um, going, going from the other direction, which, as you said, is, you know, you've got control over your backup focus there. Maybe that's the better place to start from the right-hand side going left rather than from the left-hand side going right. The, where I disagree, which is fun, uh, <laughs> is, um, do you, is people don't really have control over the backups. It's, it's not so much that uh, that you do the backups, but how you do it. Because in oh, my wow. experience, working with organizations, they're doing backups in such a way that uh, the ransomware are, are encrypting the backups or, or destroying the systems that do the backups. We say that this. And so, um, for example, this one company went out of business essentially um, because they had a disaster recovery offsite live backup network that, um, but shared domain credentials with the main network so that when the ransomware came in, they just wiped out the main network and wiped out the hot live backup network. And the, the flaw was um, that there was not sufficient separation between the backup and the main network. Right. And so like uh, shadow copies is a good thing. Shadow copies is a great way that you can set up your network so that if, ransomware people destroy it, you can instantly, with huge amounts of data, be right back where you were before, just by flipping a switch. But of course, that's the first thing that ransomware attackers attack now because of that. So how do you do your ransomware, how do you do your shadow copies to protect against ransomware? Well, it means separating the domain such that there is no path of hacking 
that gets you from a, a compromised desktop to domain admin on the servers with the shadow copies. So you have so there's a line between your backups and the rest of your network. You have to do a much better job doing that separation between the two. Okay, and 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 I go back, you know, Curtis's uh, comments about going and 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 verifying and and doing you know doing all the tabletop exercises and come up with mm -hmm. you know again you know gamification stuff, right? It's like, well, oh, we have a backup. Okay, what happens if we have shared domains? And now it's all gone. What do we do next, right? Those are things that we we think, but that, that we should be able, companies should be able to identify. Those are your weaknesses. And again, it goes what I'm what I'm saying. And thanks, Rob, Robert, for uh, proving me correct. We have control of backup and restore, right? We we know fine. Maybe what it, the way that it's set up right now is not going to work against a ransomware. But now we know. Now we know what we need to do and to fix that. It could be a simple thing as separating both of them, multi different domains, and definitely control who has access to, to, to that, only two or three people and nobody else. Um, that's what I'm, I'm referring to. How, what do you think, Liz and, and Curtis, what do you think the focus should be? What's your recommendation? No, I mean, you're absolutely right on the things you can control, but also understanding uh, one of the first things that I found uh, interesting was everyone in Atlanta, we started going back to, oh, well, we'll just pull up this document, this file. And if you didn't have it saved on, you know, a hard drive somewhere that wasn't impacted or it might be like, I, I had printed copies of some of the stuff. So I was like, oh, well, we need a copy of our insurance plan. Okay. I've got it. You know, I've got a hard copy of the coverage, but having those old school type backups, just in case of some of the key stuff, like the phone tree, who do you call? Who do you yes. email? If you're expecting to find your contacts list, uh, good luck. If your device is encrypted, <laughs> <laughs> yes, print out, kill the trees because you will also be supporting, um, the various industries that go into making the paper. Exactly. And, and, and that just bring out everything. It reminded me of, again, of a, the IRP, right? The, 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 we, we tell it, a lot of people have it. Yeah, we have it beautiful. And like Liz said, it's accessible in the cloud or whatever. And, but it's never printed. And then we go with the opposite, right? When you had the consultants come in and request, what was your thing? And the guy comes, that CISO comes in and gives them a 500 plus page, you know, IRP, and then, and then the consultant starts looking at it and says, yeah, but you know, this is outdated. Uh, when's the last time you printed it? And then it starts telling them, you know, you failed. You know, again, as an industry, a lot of the time we expect perfection, but it shouldn't be, right? I mean, this, um, you know, do what it, do the basics. Um, and, and a lot of the time you don't even have to do the basics, right? Just do the basics and, and start somewhere. Don't just assume that nothing is gonna happen to you. Um, so, Curtis, in, in, in your experience with Negotiator, where do you see, where, where have you seen that is where organizations fail the most at? And if, if they would just done a little bit, you know, due diligence, maybe they wouldn't have been on this mess. Well, I do, I do think, you, I mean, you just hit it on the head, the, the basics, <laughs> which includes some just very basic cyber hygiene things that we, we all know about. Um, and they're within our sphere of influence, like we can control most of them. Um, so, so one of that the doesn't mean, that doesn't mean you're protected hundred percent, but no, it's exactly. very basic cyber. Yep. What, one of the basics, you know, that, that everyone throws, you know, in, in, in the industry, all the experts, you know, it's um, uh, role-based access, right? Mm -hmm. Our back. This, how, it's extremely difficult to do. Well, yeah, depending it's, on the size of the organization, right? Yeah, sure. And you can say the same thing about MFA, right? right. And, and to Rob's earlier point about um, patching. It's like, there are reasons why you may not have MFA enabled on certain devices, business reasons. Um, but that, that's ultimately, a, a, a you can make a business risk decision based on, on those needs and the risk that it, it poses. The next part is, is what you talked about first, which is just have a plan for when it doesn't go well <laughs> and, and, and have some, you know, some of the basics under control there and having practiced that plan also, also helps. Um, and I do think where we see uh, where I was surprised where we see organizations fail is, is on that last part, which is 
um, even the larger companies that we deal with. And we, you know, we've worked on cases that have been in the news, the big brands, uh, they, they, they appeared to have their stuff together, like <laughs> until the moment. And then it was, it was clear that, that it was, uh, it was more theater than it was, uh, a, an actual plan and, and they hadn't practiced it and they didn't know who was in charge and they didn't know how they were going to move the money and they didn't know, they didn't know anything. And so, um, those things need to be. Go Rob. I want to ask Curtis, um, so how, what percentage of the companies do you feel that they had a plan and they followed through on the plan? You know, things didn't go well, but still they yeah. had a plan and the plan was accurate, insufficient perhaps, but it, they followed it versus having no plan whatsoever or their plan, whatever documents they had were wildly out of date of what they actually could be doing. I mean, not quantitatively, but shooting from the hip, I would say uh, 20%. You know, ha have a plan and they execute the plan. And sure, it has like areas that don't work out, but for the most part, it did its job. Uh, and then basically everybody else is sort of fumbling. Wow. Because I, I spoke with a CISO once uh, in one of our Tactical Edge events, and he said that in his experience, in one of his dark experiences where they were ransomware, that they did follow the incident response plan, right? Because they had it, because he had it. However, <laughs> It was the first time that he was personally talking to several C-level people across the company. So it's like he learned a lesson. It's not just, as you said, Curtis, it's not just a question of having one developed. It's a question of have you gone through the whole process of, you know, of, of making sure that, it, that it's, it's updated, that everyone knows what to do. At the beginning, you said about culture, communication. Right, it's it's extremely extremely important. Yeah, I would also say that in the IR plans, um, while the, I, I believe there's a very strong Venn diagram overlap of like ransomware response plan and IR plan, but there are specific items to ransomware that aren't in typical IR plans. And, and um, I'm sorry, that was my statement last week. <laughs> yeah, that, that that a lot of the IR plans don't have ransomware. And when you speak with the with the organizations, they say, well, we have specific to malware. You're like, yes, yes, but yes. We have no. to try differently. This is the question for me, for example. We have to try malware differently from ransomware. From ransomware? Yeah, I mean, yes, because the, the, the impact of the business operationally and, and financially is different. And so those things need to be, uh, those things need to be, need to be considered in advance. And having an action card for the day of that, that spells out, you know, who, who's in the room, who's, who's in charge, who do we need to call insurance? Liz touched on this insurance legal. What you know, if we need to do breach notification, for example, you know, we're not lawyers. Let's call some lawyers and figure out who we need to tell and how quickly, right? Um, well, Liz is a lawyer. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, you see what I'm saying? Is like yeah. having that all spelled out uh, in in advance is helpful. But then also the financial component. It, the, you know, the normal IR process isn't going to address. Yes. How are we acquiring crypto? Who needs to approve the wire transfer? Oh my goodness! What happens if the bad guys are on a sanctions list? Like all of those things need to be considered in advance. And and and, and so, um, how long, Curry and, and all of you, in in how long does it usually average time to recover for organizations to recover from a ransomware attack? Well, it depends on whether they 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 pay and buy a decryptor or not. Um, and it also depends on how long they can afford to be down because part of the negotiation strategy is delay. So it varies a lot. Um, okay. Usually it's, it's several weeks to sometimes months for full recover. Okay. Um, and then, well, I was going to say you have outliers like, was it Maersk that was back oh. up in like at least some level of functioning within what, 12 hours, five, six hours? Yeah, and I, I will say but... that most, most, I would say most of the victims have some partial recovery to keep them operational working, mm -hmm. but overall, it's it's still you know but recovery in a total. I suppose that is very long. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, yeah. The companies have generally there are some parts that they just never recover, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, some of it was like, well, the reason we didn't have backups for that part of the business is we're shutting it down anyway. So that's why it was, it was shut down earlier. Okay. There's uh, two questions here. Yes. Uh, thank you from, from Manuel Sirtori. Is there a golden key to 
to remediate ransomware other than a good backup policy? Or is the only alternative prevention? Is that the, the only alternative that we have? But he put another sandboxing? Yeah. Is a good alternative? Well, certainly like, there's, the, you know, and I'm sure Rob has a, a strong opinion here too, but there's certainly a lot of technologies and products that, that can help with the prevention component. I do agree with Rob that most of those things are um, sort of, uh, like you, the technology you currently have probably can do 90% of the work uh, if you want to, if you want to take the time to to set it up to do so, um, so you, it's not that you have to make a major investment. I don't think prevention is the only. Uh, right. it, I, I don't think it can be the only um, uh, right. fix. It, the response is, is a big part of that. So if you're you, like you said, you're making these business risk decisions about whether you need to to, to go to the trouble of you know implementing our role based access control across the organization or uh, you know MFA on every single device and application and and things like that. Um, Ultimately, you know, there's a chance you're going to get hit. You should have a plan for that. And restoration should be, it's also a tool in the toolbox. Technically, there's no master key. Like the, the threat actors uh, are typically encrypting on a, on, a, on a victim by victim basis. There's no, you know, in, for most, most of the ones that we deal with, there's no master decryptor someplace that we can, we can uh, get back. Obviously, we could go down a rat hole with the whole Kaseya thing, which is somewhat dubious. But yeah, <laughs> anyway, I'll pause. I'll let Rob or, or Liz weigh in. Yeah, I wanted to jump in on that. Um, there's no golden key for prevention or recovery, but there is kind of a golden key of what the hackers have. So the, the thing that makes ransomware really different from all the other attacks is there is one thing, I think, that makes it different than everything else. And that is the ability of, the ransomware attackers, once they get a foothold on, the, on a desktop computer in a network, to then spread until they get control over the entire network. And that's done via Windows networking. And the, the fundamental flaw in Windows networking, the golden key that they're using, is that when they have control over a desktop, any admin that logs into the desktop, they then grab those admin privileges and then use them to then attack the servers. So um, if you've got, like you were saying earlier, a backup, you know, your backups only have three admins who can do the backups. Well, if that admin then logs into an infected desktop, yeah, you're done. You have your backups. Yeah. And that's the, the fundamental golden key that is the source of so many of these ransomware attacks. It's like they, they, they get to the desktop and they hop to one administrator and then use those privileges to get things they can hop to the next administrator. And that's where the separation issue, there's a way of uh, tiering your network privileges. Like the desktop admin should only have admin control over desktops and not servers. And mm -hmm. likewise, the server admin should never log into one of those desktops. Um, so that you, you, you tier these privileges so that um, it's not simply the separation or least privilege or all those issues. It's fundamentally looking at, you know, these desktops will get infected by hackers and that no no one with admins that can destroy the enterprise should ever log into those desktops so that's the golden key it was called pass the hash or pass the the, the, the ticket or there's other uh various techniques there's like 20 different ways using tools like mimi cats yeah they use that once i have control over desktop i can then encourage admins to come along and then grab their credentials and then use them against the enterprise yeah. so that's the sort of there's no golden key to prevent it, but that's the thing you should focus on is what golden key are the hackers using against you. If you can work more on resolving that problem, like changing all your trust relationships, kind of like requires going back to, you know, 20 years ago, you set up your network, you set up your active domain, and you've sort of been built coasting since then. You kind of have to go back to that design and fundamentally say, how do I prevent this? How do I tier these pr privileges so that, the backup admin never logs into an infected system. Wow, wow! Uh, a lot of people will say that's a lot of work, Rob. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll just we'll just assume the risks. Um, question: This 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 is a personal thing. FBI, right? Pay it because Curtis says paying the ransomware. Um, FBI, say right now, is it is it legal to pay ransomware? It's illegal to pay. Is there like some exceptions? 
what yeah. the heck is so, that? So, so first I'll say that I am not telling anyone to pay ransom. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, okay, okay. That is a that is a business decision that right. that the companies uh, right. you know I just give them information and if they decide to do it I help them that's right. that's my job um, the but yeah so it's not illegal to pay a ransom it okay. is illegal to pay a ransom in the U S if if the entity that you're transacting with is on the OFAC uh, the Office of Foreign Asset Control uh, ah. sanctions list mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's sometimes that's countries sometimes that's organizations and sometimes that's individuals. Uh, so that 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 would make it illegal and subject to a fine, usually a civil fine, a uh, civil penalty. Um, and yes, it is the Department of Justice and the FBI's official stance to tell everyone not to pay the ransom. Mm -hmm. However, in every case that we do, we, we encourage the victim to engage the FBI. Uh, we leave that up to them. Uh, and and most of them do. Most of them do. And the reason why we do that is the FBI will come in and they will say, don't you shouldn't pay the ransom. And then they will sit there quietly and gather information while you do so. Um, and that's what I want them to do, because I want them to build a database of these yeah. threat actors and their attacks and who, who they're impacting and what the cost is and at, at the macro level across all of the victims. Uh, because obviously the news isn't doing that for us, right? So the FBI has yeah. to do it. Um, and, but yeah, so it's, it's an interesting gray area. Uh, and, and part of our job is also to, to, to do those OFAC sanction checks. Uh, we, do it, we have three levels of checks that we do. Um, all the way down to the, the crypto wallet level and, and what mm. that crypto wallet has transacted with in recent history and things like that. Wow. If I understand it, and in, in you, Lawyer Liz, can correct me or Curtis, that it's strict liability on the OFAC list, which means even if you don't know they are on the list and pay them, you are still going to be guilty. Right, wow. which is why we yes. checked three times. <laughs> no, no it, exactly. But it's an interesting uh, topic, and, and I would encourage, encourage y'all to uh, pursue this with some of the uh, policy folks that are focused on Latin America, because that's just a U.S. centric. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and that doesn't even get into what other, because as, as Scythe starts to work with other uh, customers in other countries, and I see all these uh, like Reminatory. reps and warranties. Yeah. That we're not going to bribe anyone. I'm like, yeah. well, <laughs> of course we won't, but, yeah. um, and looking at that. And so when you start looking at kind of that multinational and where does your company have offices? So as I'm sure Curtis has to navigate, like, okay, is it coming from the U S division or is it coming from the, you know, totally. uh, yeah, you know whatever. Brazil office mm -hmm. or, you know, and are, is that sufficient for that? You know, how do you navigate around? Uh, but I look forward to reading a white paper or any <laughs> other uh, okay. catching the talk that hopefully y'all will be able to yeah. get someone like you know, uh, Andrea Limbaugh. That white paper, Liz. You <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Andrea's been on the show a couple of times. Uh, I mm -hmm. think we have a time for a one more question. And, and this is something regarding insurance, right? So the, the, the government, the United States government is thinking, I don't know if they did it or not, but they're, con they're considering making ransomware listing it as a terrorist attack, correct? Insurance say, well, okay, bye-bye. We, we, we don't cover that. And as Curtis said at the beginning, right? Lawyers and insurance companies get you involved because they're the first ones to get involved. But hey, we, what, what's going to happen if that's the case, if that does make it, right? That ransomware is a terrorist attack and insurance say, see ya. Well, the easy answer to that is just look at the, the policy because, you know, the policy, it's not a law that it, it's on terrorism attack that you, they don't pay insurance. It's just how they write their policies. So if you want your policy to protect against ransomware, make sure it says this policy protects against ransomware, regardless of how the government calls it a terrorist attack or not. Yes, all the rest of these things, terrorism, we won't pay out, but for ransomware, we, we, we will. So just make that part of the policy. Okay. But if it's declared an act of terrorism that moves the ransomware payment into an entirely different kind of bucket as well for the U.S. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, but you look at like with city of Atlanta, it was uh, 20 million in uh, insurance coverage that they were paying out last, you know, when folks stopped paying attention to it, that kind of thing that are you 
are companies able to take that kind of a hit directly if they've been previously relying on insurance coverage? Well, yeah, I, I just just you know, my experience has been, especially uh, I like to be an advocate for the the ones that don't end up on TV, the the, the medium, <laughs> and, and those those folks have been suffering from COVID and all these other things. So th this ransomware thing is just the the worst possible timing for them. Uh, so taking the option of making a payment off the table when there's no other option afforded them oh, okay. seems like punishing the victim to me. But right. that's that's just my opinion. Yeah. Well, on the other hand, if you took the option off the table, then of course the ransomware would, would stop attacking the country where they can't pay ransomware because there's no that's problem. That's true. That's true. It would be painful. But uh, that's what I was going to say that's a lot of pain and yeah. it's, uh, it's something that we're willing to, to assume. Uh, we run out of time. So let's let's words, let's recommendations for the Latin American season. Start with Liz. Well, it, thank you. Basically, <laughs> Best of luck as this is an, well, it's an evolving, evolving challenge. And so you already have, you know, everything else as Curtis was saying. So as your budget, your priorities and your focus that creating the culture and planning as best you can for the things that actually are within your control. Yes. Curtis. Yeah. I would just reiterate to, to look inward, uh, look, look, look at what you can currently can control um, and, and make those make those bi quantitative business decisions about what you're willing to accept from a risk perspective uh, and then have a plan to respond when when things go uh, you know south beautiful and Rob yeah my recommendation is one you can't follow is the one I just talked about earlier was that the, the key thing that I would solve if I were to go in and, and help you would be to address that problem that um, they get the admin privileges on the, on the domains. And that would help you restructure your domains to fix that. I don't know how you're going to do it. <laughs> I know you probably can't do it. I know it's going to take time for you to look at your peers in the industry, see how they did it before you can like copy how they did it. Yes. But that is, when I look at the attacker side, you know, defenders, I have no advice for, but from attackers, that's what they're doing to, to attack you. Okay, beautiful. Andres, this was, wow. <laughs> really? Yes, totally. Amazing. Thank you yes. so much. We have uh, people here from the attendees. Uh, thank you very much for this great conversation from Gustavo Camacho, uh, Mayor Fabricio Galindo Urarte. You know, thank you so much for being here to the panelists. Really appreciate yeah. your time. Thank you. And, yes, uh, really and, uh, appreciate it. Looking forward to hosting you in person one of these days, maybe 2022. That'll be fantastic. Uh, and uh, todos que eh, están presentes, muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Esperamos que haya sido una, una charla con, con muy buena información. Para mí fue muy buena información. Y el programa está siendo grabado y estará disponible esta noche. Así que nos vemos pronto. Hasta luego a todos. Guys, thank you so see much. You. And we didn't see you, Mr. Rainer. So, <laughs> our lost. <laughs> see you guys later. Bye-bye.